Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second of our Ian Ramsey Centre seminars on science and religion uh, for Michaelmas term 2011. The title of tonight's seminar is Chaos and the Character of God, and we're very pleased to welcome Professor Paul Ewart, who is Head of Atomic and Laser Physics uh, here at Oxford. Professor Ewart is uh, Head of the Department of Atomic and Laser Physics. He's a graduate of Queen's University, Belfast. He's been a CERC Advanced Fellow at Imperial College London. Uh, he was Royal Academy of Engineering Senior Research Fellow here at Oxford, Visiting Fellow at the Joint Institute of um, Laboratory Astrophysics, Boulder, United States, Visiting Fellow at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, and at the University of Otago in New Zealand. His research involves laser studies of molecular physics with applications to combustion, environmental and cell biology. He's also a member of mm -hmm. Kiddington Baptist Church. He's married with two children and has recently become a grandfather. Um, as usual for these talks, we, uh, I've, I've said to Professor Ewart that you could speak for up to an hour and then we have uh, up to half an hour for questions. So would you please welcome Professor Paul Ewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much for coming. Um, I had a few emails from people who told me that they weren't coming, but no one actually wrote to say they were coming, so it's nice to see you here, and, and I, I appreciate uh, your giving up your evening. And, and, of course, this is a seminar and not just a lecture, so um, the difference is that after I've said my bit, you get to make your comments and ask questions. Um, just so long as we get straight right from the very beginning that you're not expecting me to give all the answers. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you say and to just have an exchange of views um, on this topic um, of chaos and the character of God. Um, now, I have the pleasure of being married to an English teacher and she's kind of um, infected me with a love for alliteration, hence character and chaos in the title. So just to get straight what I mean by those, those two words to begin with, by um, chaos, I mean states that are characterized by randomness, chance. There are situations where we don't know what's coming next, either because it's unpredictable by its very nature or because we're just not smart enough to work out what's going to come next. So the word chaos is really a shorthand for states that arrive by chance, whether we know the cause of the situation or not. It's inherently unpredictable and we call that chaos. By character of God, I mean, is God a person? Or is God some kind of cosmic force, some kind of uh, influence for our betterment, uh, simply a word that describes our love of what is good or our aspirations um, for higher things? Or is God, in fact, personal and can he be experienced and known as such? So that's what lies behind the title, Chaos and the Character of God. Now, um, the reason why I've, I've chosen this topic is because science today has actually gone through something of a transformation in the last hundred years or so. Modern science as we know it really began um, in the early uh, 17th century, more or less. And it's fair to say, and commonly accepted these days, that the biblical idea of a creator was a major influence in the rise of modern science. Because the Bible spoke of a creator who brought the universe into being in an ordered way. And this was in contradistinction to other prevailing myths at the time where we exist at the whim of capricious gods. And the story in Genesis presents a very ordered and structured creation where everything is in its place for a purpose and speaks of a creator um, bringing that order. And therefore it made sense to seek for order in creation. And indeed, science has been spectacularly successful in the last few hundred years in uncovering a deep order all the way down to the tiniest particles that we know of, the quarks, that they exist and everything in the larger scale is tied together in a supreme um, ordered structure. 
Now, of course, our experience of nature is actually a difference. When we look around us, we find that nature is random. Everywhere we look, pebbles on a beach, leaves on a woodland floor, the shapes of clouds, flickering flames, the turbulence of a wave breaking, all speak of disorder, randomness and chaos and the influence of chance in the world and indeed in our own lives. And so it was against that background that the early scientists were looking for an order that they believed to exist because God had made it so. That Genesis spoke of a ordered creation. That the prophets also spoke of the regularity of harvest uh, being the result of a gift of God and not a result of pagan sacrifices. And that it was a faithful God who was providing for the Israelites' needs. And the psalmist in Psalm 19 says, of course, Heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And St. Paul in Romans also declares that what can be known about God? His invisible nature, his eternal power, and his deity is plain to see all around us. And so it was that the many of the members of the Royal Society, the founding members, were convinced by the view that God could be revealed not just in the book of his word but in the book of his world. Now one of the the greatest triumphs of, of modern science and the scientific revolution in its early stages was Isaac Newton's discovery that the laws that we uncover here on earth apply also to the heavenly bodies. And this was a dramatic breakthrough because it told us that the universe was all of a piece and that it could be viewed as a kind of giant cosmic clockwork, a giant machine whose regularity, whose obedience to laws and its dependability reflected the nature of its creator, a faithful, dependable God. Now, of course, as this notion took hold, it's developed, as it were, into a rather different idea of God, one that came to see God as outside the machine, because here was a machine that could simply run on its own, following predetermined laws of behavior. And so developed deism, that God was remote, distant, unconcerned with human life. On the other hand, theism, classical theism indeed, would have rescued this um, idea and brought back an imminent as well as a transcendent God. But it brought back a view of God that was also influenced by Greek philosophy. Theism's God is a spirit, immaterial, omniscient, almighty, and immutable, unchangeable. So both theism and deism are inherently deterministic, that things simply follow the rigid pattern of law and under the control of a supremely determining God. And God controls every element of every detail of every event. Now, the theological car crash that happens when you put these things together is that that means that because there is evil and suffering in the world, that God must therefore be responsible for that as well. And I think this was a particular problem for Einstein. He also was a resolute determinist, of course, and he was famously sceptical about quantum theory and its claim to be a complete theory. Underneath, he felt that things must be determined and ordered by law and not left to the vagaries of indeterminate chance. So God does not play dice, said Einstein. And his, his manifesto, as it were, uh, was expressed in, in a book that he wrote. And he makes this statement. Everything is determined by forces over which we have no control. It is determined for the insect as well as for the star. 
human beings, vegetables or cosmic dust. We all dance to a mysterious tune intoned in the distance by an invisible piper. So when Einstein talks about God, of course, he has a particular idea. And it was more the God of the philosophers, the God of Spinoza that he had in mind and not the God that we know in and through Jesus, for example. In fact, the idea of a personal God was quite foreign to Einstein. And he said in those very words, the idea of a personal God is quite alien to me and seems even naive. The problem for Einstein was that if God was determining everything that happens, he was therefore responsible for the evil that men do and the suffering in the world. And therefore when he came to judge the world, he would be passing judgment on himself. Now, an interesting question occurs to me, and that is that although this is not a logically uh, rigorous connection to make, but if, according to Einstein, determinism implies that God is not personal, does indeterminism imply that God is a person? That's something that we're going to explore tonight. But I want to... um, examine the role of chance in modern science and the chaos that that sometimes leads to. Now everybody today knows about the role of chance, um, particularly in the theory of evolution, that it's the random mutations that occur in the genes of living organisms that is acted upon by natural selection that leads to the evolution of different life forms. But chance is also deeply fundamental to our best theories in physics, and in particular to uh, quantum theory, which is the best theory of anything that anyone has ever had, ever. (laughs) So our best theory is suffused with this idea of indeterministic chance. So if on the one hand science began with a picture of an ordered creation, following the ordered laws imposed by God, and we could infer that stability and faithfulness of God from his ordered creation, what does inherent randomness and chaos tell us about God? Now, let me say, first of all, that there are basically uh, two kinds of chance. There's the kind of chance that... um, arises because we are not clever enough to work out what's going to come next, and so we have to guess. And so things may be caused, but we don't understand the causes, and so we can't predict what's going to happen. When I'm playing tennis, I have a distinct advantage over my opponent, because when I serve to him, he has no idea where the ball is going to go. That's because I have no idea where the ball is going to go. So I'm not good enough to determine the course of the, of the tennis ball. And there are other problems which are just too complicated for us to work out. And so it's a matter of chance to us what will happen. And we call that, because it has to do with our knowledge of the situation, epistemological chance. I think that's probably the biggest word I'm going to use tonight. Okay, So it means the chance that has to do with our knowledge or our lack of it. But there's another kind of chance. A chance that might be, as it were, pure chance. Radically random occurrences that have no discernible cause. Perhaps no cause at all. They just happen by pure happenstance. And we might call this ontological chance. Now, in both cases, the common property is that we can't predict what's going to happen. And for the purposes of tonight's discussion, I don't want to get too bogged down on the distinction between one kind and the other. As far as God is concerned, one might think the worst case scenario is that there is ontological chance that there are things that not even God can know is going to happen. And what would be the consequences for God's character if that were true? That's the kind of thing we want to think about tonight. So there is um, chance at the basis of a lot of our science. As we've mentioned, it's what drives evolution. 
by random mutations, acted upon by the necessity of physical laws. It's at the heart of atomic theory, the quantum theory of subatomic matter. It even comes in to climate science and our ability or inability to predict the weather. And chaos theory has been invoked to describe what happens, although to some extent chaos theory is a slight misnomer because it deals with deterministic equations. It's just that they're very sensitive to the initial conditions and so we can't reliably predict what's going to happen because there might be small changes that we don't know about. Of course, the chaos of the financial system is only too well known to us at the moment that we just don't know what's going to happen next because this situation is just too complicated. There are too many unknowns for us to predict what's going to happen. And if anyone in this room knows how to predict what's going to happen to the stock market, could you have a word with me afterwards? <laughs> so I'm going to take uh, the position that chance is real, and it's not simply a result of our ignorance. And this might be an appropriate point to pick up a point that was raised by our previous speaker, Dame um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, um, a very eminent uh, person. And you might, if you were here two weeks ago, you'll recognise that we share a common accent because we both come from the north of Ireland. Um, but if you know anything about religion in the north of Ireland, you won't be surprised to know that we don't agree about everything. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that she happened to drop into the seminar was the idea that the universe just made itself by chance. It just sort of popped into existence as a result of a quantum fluctuation. Now, I have to say that I find this idea um, nonsense, uh, not to put too polite a word on it. Um, I think it's a confusion between two senses of the word nothing. For something to come out of nothing, in the philosophical sense, is an incoherent statement. And even in our common sense, use of the word nothing means no thing, nothing at all, not even anything. Whereas nothing in quantum theory is the zero point of an quantum field and we use that to describe the universe in which we live that if we take everything we can out of space we're still left with a vacuum that fluctuates and it's certainly the case then that spontaneously particles may appear and disappear but they are governed by the laws of the uncertainty principle and the other laws of quantum mechanics so the zero point field is not nothing it is a state of affairs that's governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. That's not the same as philosophical nothing. So it's a confusion in terms to say that the universe could simply appear out of nothing in that sense. So we may come back to that later. But I want to pick up the challenge of chance, really, from the scientific point of view and what it means for belief in God. It began really with the writings in the modern area of, of Jacques Mono, a, a Nobel Prize winning um, evolutionary biologist, in his book, I think it was 1950s, Chance and Necessity, he writes this, Man at last knows he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe, out of which he has emerged by chance. Now this idea has been taken up by the new atheists and particularly by Professor Dawkins in this university to argue that because our existence is so much based on chance it cannot possibly have any purpose because by definition chance is meaningless, purposeless, it has no purpose in mind. So for the atheists today the existence of chance means that there is no God, there is no purpose of creator behind the universe or our existence. Now interestingly, this argument is also um, really taken up by the intelligent design advocates and creationists of different hues, because they would argue that chance means that there is no design in nature and therefore no designer God. And so they would argue um, that chance is inimical to the existence of a God who would be in control of his creation. Now, of course, this is an idea that has a long history. The Hebrew people were inherently deterministic in their outlook. 
and the Greeks also, and the idea of a transcendent, all-powerful, and immutable God determining the outcomes is deeply entrenched in classical theism. That it's God who determines everything, and therefore chance is only the appearance of chance, that underneath there is a cause and a determination for everything. So in classical Christian theology, chance means that God is not sovereign. He's not in control of his creation. For example, John Calvin writes, There is nothing cheaper than a sparrow, and yet God's eye is upon it, and nothing happens to it by chance. Those are my italics. Will he then, who looks after sparrows, neglect to look after the lives of men? So we see that for atheists, chance is real and God is a delusion. For creationists and classical theists, God is real and chance is the delusion. Now I want to suggest to you tonight that they may all be wrong. That chance may be real and so is God. And what is more, perhaps there is something that we can learn about the nature of God from the fact that he has made a universe where chance has been given such an important role. See, the problem here is that the reality of chance seems to imply that even if God exists, he is not in control. Now, this was another point that was raised in our last seminar by Professor Bell Burnell. For her, the problem was that the mere existence of suffering in the world meant that God is not in control. Because if he was, he would do something about it. That was the logic. So that's something we need to grapple with tonight if we're going to take seriously this notion that chance is real in the creation of a good and loving God. Now, this is a problem of theodicy that is very ancient, and I hope you're not expecting me to solve it for you all tonight. Um, Nonetheless, I think it's perhaps useful for us together to look at some of the assumptions that lie behind the logic of that position. Because clearly, from a logical point of view, it is perfectly possible for there to be suffering and for there to be a God. Because as we've seen with Einstein, it would make God responsible for that suffering. And if that was all that could be said on the subject, then God would be a monster and unworthy of our worship. And so that's what makes the problem of suffering very real for us. A few years ago, a book got wide coverage called When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold Kushner. And this was a book that was written out of the experience of personal tragedy um, in Rabbi Kushner's own family. His son died of a very um, strange and distressing illness. And it was out of that experience that Rabbi Kushner wrote this book. And basically his conclusion was that stuff happens, as we put it today, that these things just happen for no reason at all. And we can't blame God for them. Because much as he'd like to, God can't do anything about it. That's just the nature of things, that God is not omnipotent. So in order to salvage, as it were, the love of God, he had to sacrifice God's omnipotence. Now, of course, when one makes any critique of Rabbi Kushner's book, it's not to be taken as a criticism of him because his suffering was very real and we must be sensitive to that. But the fact that it comes out of that experience does not of itself validate the conclusion. Not even within classical uh, Judaism was his conclusion accepted. Another rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak Kirchner, wrote that in response to this book, that if he, if God, is not responsible for the bad, 
neither can he be credited with the good. And that means, of course, then, that God is irrelevant. If he cannot do anything to help us, what's the point of having him? So, at the heart of our problem here is this issue of what kind of creation is it of a God that leaves so much to chance? Would a good creator actually leave anything to chance? Well, my answer to that is a qualified yes. And I hope in the remaining time to explore what I mean by that. I want to say that chance may actually be necessary if God is to be in control. And this is something we want to look at together. First of all, I want to explain why chance can be seen in a very positive light. That randomness doesn't always lead to change and decay. We are familiar with the randomness in biological evolution. And it's been argued, for example, by Arthur Peacock that... um, This is the most efficient way in which God's creation can explore the range of possibilities that are allowed by the laws of physics. And the other spin-off, of course, is by using this mechanism of randomness and chance in the evolution of life, it produces a life form which is extraordinarily robust and can cope with unexpected changes in the environment or the surroundings of the organism. For example, all our immune systems operate using random mutations to find an antigen to some invader to our bodies. So we have a life form that's very robust against sudden changes. A deterministic system would be very brittle. A small change could scupper it. But a random system is much more adaptable and can change to accommodate any dangers that come up. So that's one area in which, in biology, randomness has a very positive benefit. But I'm a physicist, and so um, I'm going to talk a bit about physics for the next few minutes. If physics is not your thing, I'll sort of wave wave to you when I'm over that bit, and you can can join us again. Um, But I had a kind of epiphany, as it were, in my own work a few years ago, and it came about by studying things called quantum jumps. And some of you will know what they are. There are these sudden uh, jumps between one state of an atom and another. For example, when we shine lights on an atom, it jumps from one state to another, and we call that a quantum jump. Now, quantum theory, against popular opinion, is actually very deterministic. The equations that govern what happens in quantum theory are rigorously deterministic mathematically. What they allow us to do is to calculate the probability of something happening, whether this quantum jump will happen or not. And so if our equations tell us that the probability is zero, then that means zero. It means never. It will not happen. And that's deterministic. Right down to ground zero. So that means that When a transition is forbidden by some kind of quantum phenomenon, the probability is zero, it will not happen. And what we were looking at was what happens when an atom absorbs two little bits of light called photons. And we start off here with the atom in its ground state, and we shine two blips of light onto it. Here's one and two, and it absorbs both of them and jumps to a different quantum state. So far, so good. Now, of course, I've got two photons here that are slightly different. One's bigger than the other. And the atom can't tell the difference between the first one coming first and the second one then and the other way around. So we have to allow it to do that one as well. The trouble is, when you do that, they have the same probability, but one's plus and one's minus. When you add them together, you get zero. So that means the poor atom can't move. It's stuck. It's determined to stay there. It will not make that jump. Now, here's the thing that happened when we were doing our experiments, that the photons, um, instead of having this destructive interference because they were fixed and rigid, we used photons that were sort of a bit chaotic and jumping about a bit, a bit random. So here they are jiggling about. And when that happens, actually, 
the atom does make the quantum jump. So when we add this randomness, something happens that wouldn't have happened before. So what we get here is a probability that is not zero anymore. It's allowed because the destruction of the destructive interference has itself been cancelled by these random fluctuations. So this randomness has created something that wasn't possible before. And so I began to think, well, perhaps chance can actually have a creative and positive benefit, even with these inanimate objects at the heart of our universe. The important thing to notice here is, and this is the take-home message for this little bit, and you can wake up now if you didn't like physics, because all you've got to remember from this is that chance destroys determinism. That's the result here. These random fluctuations break the iron grip of even the quantum determinism is broken by this random fluctuation. And so the world is set free to follow different paths that would normally be forbidden in a fully deterministic world. So we see that chance can be creative at different levels, all the way up from atoms to cells and whole organisms. So I want to put to you that chaos is actually part of God's creation for a purpose. If you go back to the very beginning of the book of the Bible in Genesis, the first two verses, you find in verse 2, uh, we read this, that the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now I'm told that for the Hebrews... The oceans, the deep, the waters were a metaphor for chaos. That here, right at the beginning of creation, is chaos. And note that God has made it. So God is using chaos as part of his creative process. So, if that's true, if chance is real... Doesn't that mean that God is no longer going to be in control? Or to use the theological word, is God still sovereign? Well, I want to, as I suggested earlier, to say that God will only be sovereign if chance is real. It seems kind of counterintuitive. But I want to submit to you that this randomness is not just part of the problem. Actually, it's part of the solution. And in particular, one of the hardest problems that we have to deal with, that's the problem of suffering. Why is suffering so random? You see, I don't know if it's the same with you, but the suf- problem of suffering is bad enough. But the fact that it's so unfair is even harder to understand, it seems to me. We think that we could live with the idea that bad things could happen as long as they only happen to bad people. But that's not the way it is. It seems that these bad things happen irrespective of our moral deserts. Even to people who would never have done anything to deserve such suffering. And that for me is the hardest part of the problem. And therefore I think it's instructive to attack this issue right at its hardest point. Why is suffering random? So I want to say that if we can find some way forward here, we might go some way towards solving the bigger problem of the existence of suffering or chaotic suffering in God's world. And there are three things that we have to take on board here. And they're on this diagram. First of all, chance, of course, that's our topic for tonight. And secondly, there's the laws of nature that give order and reliability and predictability to our world that allow us to to live in an ordered kind of way. And the third of this trinity is free will. Now I'm going to, for the sake of tonight's discussion, assume that all three of these things are real. We might pick up some of the issues later on in discussion. But let's take it that we have both chance, free will operating in a world that's governed by ordered laws of nature. Now, what's going to happen? If suffering were not to be random, what's the alternative? It would mean that suffering would have to depend somehow on the morality of the person involved, that only bad things would happen only to bad people. And if I wanted to do something evil to hurt someone, 
then God would have to step in to prevent that happening. Now, we have free will, and so I can make that choice, and I can use the predictable, ordered laws of nature to ensure that the piece of wood that I am going to use to hit Andrew over the head stays rigid and hard and won't be turned to a piece of cotton wool by God just at the critical moments. So I can rely on the orderness of nature. I use my free will to commit an evil act and then God would have to step in to prevent it if moral laws are to take precedence over the physical laws. So God must intervene to prevent this suffering in this case. So that means we can force God to act because, of course, if God's going to be fair, he has to do the same thing in response to the same act. And therefore, in principle, I could force God to act in a predictable way. And that means that God is not sovereign, that he's reacting to my free will. And so perhaps when we see what the consequences of a non-random universe are, we face this problem that God cannot be in control if we have free will in a world that is ordered by natural laws and we can do what we wish. But of course, the third aspect to our world is that there is chance. And I want to suggest that perhaps here we have a clue to the purpose of chance. Because in a world where chance operates... There's inherent randomness and therefore unpredictability to everything that we do. So in principle, it may not be possible for us to predict what God might do in response to our actions, or even when something happens, to know with confidence that's what God did. Of course, it might just have been a coincidence. And to quote Einstein again, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. So in a way, this inherent unpredictability insulates God from us, that we can't predictably force God to act in a predetermined way. And therefore, God remains sovereign. And this randomness, as it were, prevents us from controlling God's actions because we can no longer exploit his consistency and make sure that he acts the same way to every act of ours. And so, because chance exists, we can't control God, and God remains in principle in control as sovereign. Chance itself allows God to keep control. Now, having said that, of course, there's perhaps a problem here, because if it works one way, does it not work the other way too? Does it not prevent, does chance not prevent God acting upon us? if he's subject to the whims of random events. Well, let me give an example here. There are computer programs that people can write to do fairly routine operations, like sorting, for example. <clears throat> and I've been drawing it in a diagram here and on the left. We'll let it run through. It starts, goes through various processes, and ends up at the finish. It's completed its work. Now, you know and I know that in this world there are some bad people who enjoy writing computer viruses. And it's quite easy to write a virus to be put into this program that will cause it to get stuck in a loop. And the wretched computer will just go round and round and round forever. And it will never complete its task because of its inherent predictability that computers are deterministic machines. And once it gets stuck there, it's no way of getting out. Now, a clever computer programmer can look at this situation and realize that what he can do is he can build into his program occasional random jumps so that here's one that's got stuck in this loop. Then eventually, the program makes this random jump. It jumps out of the loop, picks up where it left off, and completes its task. And this is an example of the use of these random processes in computing that can protect a deterministic system from the evil influences of a malign hacker. Now, can you see the analogy here? That randomness will insulate God's creation from the worst excesses of our evil, that we cannot even be allowed to control what God can do. 
And so this could be one purpose for chaos and chance in God's world. So another way of thinking of this this is to use the example of um, free will. How can free will be free if God is in control of everything? And William James came up with a very helpful uh, analogy to provide some kind of explanation for this. He wants us to imagine an infinitely wise chess player, a chess grandmaster. Now we know when we're playing a grandmaster at chess, we can make any move that we like. We can choose our moves within the laws of the game, and there are zillions of moves in any game of chess, and we're free to choose whichever we want. But if you're a betting man, you shouldn't bet on me because the grandmaster will win. No matter what I do, he's always going to find a way around it and to take whatever I do and win the game. So I have free will, and yet the grandmaster is still in ultimate control. So I want to extend that analogy to nature itself. Suppose then that um, just as the grandmaster can allow free will and still win, so also random events can occur in nature, but a sovereign creator like a grandmaster can adapt to whatever happens in the world and take it from there and still bring about his sovereign will. So randomness can be allowed to operate and yet God can still stay in ultimate control. So chance, even ontological chance, is still consistent with God being in control, with God still being sovereign. Now if we go back to Calvin's uh, view of the orderliness and sovereignty of God... You have a picture, remember, of God being in complete control and micromanaging every situation. But now we're looking at a picture where, at some levels, there are things that happen that even God can't control. But nonetheless, whatever happens, he will be able to respond to it and to work with it. And so we have here a picture of God that's different from the classical theism's picture. It's more in tune with what we now know as open theism. And this is expressed by John Sanders, who says that God has the love, the wisdom, the perseverance and power to deal with any situation that arises as God carries out his creational project. So if we then go back to the classical view and Calvin's allusion to the fall of a sparrow, he was, of course, referring to the words of Jesus who said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of these will fall to the ground without your father. And and then I've left a blank. And if you go to your Bible, you'll find that it actually says, not one of these will fall to the ground without your father wills. However, if you read another translation, it says, without your father knows. Now, actually, if you go to the Greek, apparently, and I'm not a Greek scholar, I looked this up in a book, and it tells me that there's nothing there in the Greek. It's just left hanging. So it could be either wills or knows. Now, I'm quite happy to leave it hanging. But if you force me, I'd plump for without your father knows. Because he can be watching everything that happens without determining it, and whatever happens, he can work with it. So we have here a vision of a God who can play more than one game, if you will. That we are not simply part of a giant cosmic plan that unfolds in a predetermined, predestined way. That we have a more dynamic universe in which God is engaged with us in whatever happens. When I was teaching my children to ride a bicycle, this isn't a picture of me, by the way, this is... But I used to do what this mother is doing and I would hold the child's bicycle by the saddle and to begin with they were very glad for me to hold it. And as they got more confident they'd say stop holding I want to do it myself. And I'd run along and my hand would be about an inch below the saddle. You know the idea. Just in case they fall you can catch them. And we do that as a father because we want them to learn how to 
balance, how to respond to the random bumps and jumps that occur as you ride a bicycle. And perhaps that's what God is doing with us. By allowing chance and real randomness to occur in our lives, that we learn to respond and cope with them, knowing that he is there with us. And the psalmist spoke of that as well. In Psalm 16, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Thou holdest my lot. A random lot thrown in the hand of God. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. That was the confidence that he had even in a world where random things happen. So we have now, because of the chaos in the world, the opportunity for a dynamic relationship with God. That he is by our right hand, no matter what happens to us. For good or ill, God is there with us in it, in the ups and downs of life. If we think about the context of Jesus' teaching about sparrows, you may remember that the context is one where he's speaking to his followers about persecution about the future in which they would face danger, death, all kinds of suffering, perhaps even random suffering. Certainly wasn't going to be deserved. And yet the message he was telling them was that no matter what happens to you, you will come to no eternal harm. That even if your body is killed, you will be safe. And this was expressed, I think, beautifully by Rupert Brooke, the poet in the First World War, who in the trenches would have faced the dangers of a random bullet or a shell, and random death was all around him, and yet he could write these words, Safe shall be my going, secretly armed against all death's endeavour, safe though all safety's lost, safe where men fall, And if these poor limbs die, safest of all. So, what does chaos tell us about the character of God? Well, I think that creates a world of uncertainty, and it's in just that kind of world that we need faith. Faith operates when we don't know what's going to happen next. And we are encouraged then to walk by faith and not by sight. And by doing that, by trusting in a God, even when we don't know what's happening or can't explain it, nonetheless, we can develop a hope that no matter what happens, we will come to no eternal harm. And so our hope, in distinction from what Professor Bell Burnell was telling us that didn't exist in the universe, our hope will be not in the maintenance of a material universe, But our hope is in a person who loves and cares for us. And we are invited in that situation into a relationship. And in that relationship we can experience genuine love. And love is something that happens between two people. So I believe that our conclusion is that chaos does tell us something about the character of God. Chaos and chance has a creative purpose. First of all, it frees the world from determinism. It allows free will. It allows situations to develop in which we can make genuine moral decisions and where we have free will and choice. And above all, it safeguards God's sovereignty that no matter what we choose, no matter what happens, God can still bring about his purpose for us. So chaos, in the end, gives each of us Because each of us is different. We stumble through life differently. We experience different things. And so each of us has this possibility of a unique experience of God as a person. And I'll leave it there. It's over to you. for a very wide-ranging talk. We wanted to um, 
have a chance to catch some of the questions, and um, I, I'm holding the microphone, so what I, what I want to do is, if you ask a question, I, I will summarise it, or repeat it, and um, Professor Hewitt will, will provide an answer or a suggestion, <laughs> we hope. So, um, does anyone like to go first? Yes. Um, yes, and then, then just, yes. I'm reminded of a, a hymn I've always been fond of uh, by Richard, I can't remember the surname, How Firm a Foundation Ye Sense of the Lord. The third verse, particularly, mm -hmm. when through fiery trials thy heart shall go. Lie, his grace source sufficient shall be yes. thy supply. Ah, yes. The flame shall not hurt okay. thee, his only desire. Design. I dross to consume and I like go gold to refine. refine. Yes, sir. Uh, would you say that that is in a sense saying what you're saying? I would go along with that hymn. It's one of my favourites too. Yes. <laughs> but uh, and, and what I'm, I suppose, refining in that concept is that God is not, <coughs> need not be designing each specific test that we experience in life, that whatever happens he can use it to help us develop our faith and trust in him Is it not suggest that the yes. pathway may lie through it and that isn't actually Oh absolutely, yes a, a, Could be the chance, but yes. there's this other force there available Yes, yes. yes. I think I'm a slight change of plan as this is not going to work very well Perhaps okay. like I'm going to pass the microphone to the person who asked a question Perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Silva you would be able to come and uh, hand the microphone around Thank you. Yes, I, I wonder. Uh, maybe you should become an Orthodox Christian. I don't know. There's a lot of um, very interesting thought there. So, in understanding, basically, God in creating the universe in such a manner gives us true and utter freedom. And in that true freedom that we have, we have an opportunity to be truly and utterly creative in some manner. And then, perhaps. I wondered what you think about the, the purpose of our creativity would be then. I know in the orthodox view we might view it in some form of theosis as growing closer and ever and ever and ever closer to God. But um, yes, I just wondered what your thoughts were on mankind's own creativity given this freedom. Wow, that's a huge topic. Um, perhaps we could have another seminar tonight. Could we? <laughs> <laughs> But I need, I need some time to think about that one. I, I, I think you're right that um, there's certainly an element in which um, others have seen our life as um, a veil of, of sorrow, a veil of soul-making, where our experiences help us to develop our relationship with God and to prepare us in some sense for um, an eternity with him. Um, how much development we, we, we actually make in any one life um, will vary enormously, I guess. Um, and only God will ultimately be able to answer that question. Um, but I'm sure God wants to involve us in creation and in being creative because even in Genesis it speaks about... Um, I remember that the earth had no, nothing growing on it because there was no man to till the soil. So it was as were that the creation had, God had intended us to be part of his creative act and therefore he's doing something in and through us. And that's part of the Christian life that God's love is, is experienced through what people like you and me do in our lives and, and we, we bring God's love into the world by what we do. And we're able to do that only by God's grace, not by our own strength, but by the, having him in, in, indwell us more and more by his spirit. Okay. Yes, it also hints very much at our own an utterly unique relationship that each and every one of us has yes. with God um, yes. in this ability to be uniquely creative. Yes. So all part of a body of Christ as such. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Um, I was just um, interested um, about how you think um, this idea, which seemed very attractive to me in terms of uh, addressing a number of the big issues that you raised, how does it relate to um, what you might view as a traditional conception of heaven and hell? Will, will heaven be a very boring, predetermined place? Or will we have chaos in heaven? <laughs> and will uh, hell be very boring? I, I, well, I think yes. Um, 
I think hell will be boring because it will be nothing. I think heaven will be wonderful because it will be everything. They're quite opposites in my view. I, I, I look forward to a joyous kind of chaos in heaven. Um, and, and actually the new earth that we will inhabit, which is the Christian hope that we will live in a, a recreated universe, not one that's just fizzled out, um, but one that God remakes. And that I remember having a discussion with my son um, and we often enjoy walking and climbing over the mountains and, and this is the joy of putting your feet up with a pint at the end of a long day and that achy feeling in your bones that you only get after the real effort of walking all day and it's a kind of pleasant pain if you will and, and my son asked me uh, Daddy said will there be pain in heaven like this <laughs> and I guess there will because there's a kind of pleasure in it um, and, and there really, everything that we, we get a foretaste of, I think of, of the new heaven and the new earth uh, in the joys that we experience in this life and I, I see them as simply um, a little down payment, as it were, a little taster of what's to come. So I will not be surprised, well, if there are surprises, um, in heaven. <laughs> if we accept that God can cope with any situation that arises, and I don't disagree. Pardon? What would... Oh, sorry. Yeah, if we accept that God can cope with every situation that arises, would you agree that everything happens for a reason? I.e., if something happens, it makes us stronger. So the question is, um, if God can cope with everything, anything that happens, does anything, everything happen for a reason? That's what I'm thinking. Yes. yes. Is there a reason why? And does it make us stronger? And when we've got evil, do we come out of that stronger than we were before? Yes. Well, I think that um, there may not be a, a reason in the causative sense that something happened um, and the intention was for that event to happen. But if it happens, then God can use it for our good. So that, for example, at the end of Genesis, uh, we get that wonderful encounter between Joseph and his brothers. And he says to them what they did to him. Uh, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. So that they, they chose those actions um, out of evil intent, but nonetheless God was able to bring good out of it. So that that's not to say that God made them do those evil things, but the fact that they did it, God could work with. No, I understand. So yes, he puts yes. whatever's wrong, we put right. Yes. Yeah. yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. I understood you to say that the Hebrews had a very deterministic view of the world and you quoted a number of times from the book of Genesis. Only in your remarks now have you quoted from the radically different second version of creation that we have in the opening chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first chapter, that story world has a God who knows what he's doing, everything is planned. Mm -hmm. Step one has steps two, three, four, five already in mind and it's all very ordered and deterministic in a sense but the story world in, in the other creation story is very different isn't it where we have a God who forms this creature out of the uh, stuff of the earth and doesn't quite know what will happen or what to do with it find, then realises it's not a good situation how things are does a bit more tweaking or fiddling around and that doesn't work either and, and so this is a God who doesn't know what's going to happen, doesn't know how the creative enterprise will work out I wonder if that other story world from Genesis 2 uh, and one could go on with other things where God does seem to be playing dice with the world and with humanity whether that gives us uh, some interesting theological aspects to play with perhaps more suited to the world of chaos as we now understand it than that magisterial first creation story does yes I, I understand your question you're suggesting that um, there are two sets of Hebrew two different aspects of Hebrew thought about God's creation and chance and that's certainly true the the, even the Old Testament is not uniformly deterministic. In fact, um, 
although they, 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 they drew lots, for example, um, sometimes they, it's seen that God determines the outcome of the, of the throw of the die. Um, and Ecclesiastes speaks and Proverbs speaks of, of um, time and chance happening to all men. And one thinks of um, even an incident like Gideon's fleece, where Gideon is seeking guidance from God and he puts out a fleece and prays that in the morning there will be dew on the fleece and dry all around. And he'll take that as a sign from God. And sure enough, the next morning there's dew on the fleece and it's dry all around. And he thinks, well, that might just have been chance. Um, So we better do it the other way around. And so we'll have the dew on the ground and dry on the fleece next time, please. And that happens. And so here we have an example of a kind of Fisher significance test in statistics. Okay, what are the chances of that? Those two improbable events happening? Very small. Therefore, it's not chance. God's at work here. Okay. So they they did have a notion of chance. They did have a sense that there were things that were unpredictable and um, that perhaps. They would probably have thought that God would have foreseen and know exactly what was going to happen, even if he wasn't determining it. Um, So I think there's a certain openness to both both views there. you're not uh, pulling man off the hook with this interpretation Um, that if we have the knowledge if we act out of the knowledge, particularly the knowledge that you bring to the table with science if we act out of knowledge to create global warming, for example do we just shrug and say ha, take care of that one God, you know, we, we acted badly and Here's, there is going to be scientifically lots of suffering as a result of that. And, you know, I, I don't like a theology that takes us off the hook there. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the hope I'm supposed to have. I absolutely agree with you. And I wasn't intending to take us off the hook. I mean, far from it, because um, I'm suggesting that the inherent orderliness of God's world that there are these laws of nature that have consequences if we do certain things and we can predict some of them and we may well be able to predict global warming as a consequence of what we are doing and I'm in no sense saying that because God uh, could react to whatever we do that he necessarily will in a particular way I mean I wasn't saying that if we can do if we do something bad that God will has to step in and fix it I'm saying whatever we do, God ultimately will be able to transform what we have done and achieve his purpose. But I'm not saying I know what that purpose is. That purpose might include us dying in a heat death of this planet. And that was down to us. And we will be judged for that. And God warns us about caring for the world and for one another. So in no sense am I suggesting that we are being let off the hook because God can and will ultimately fix things his way. He will also judge us for what we've done. And so we do have to care for the world and we do have to care for one another. I want to talk a little bit about or ask you to focus on Um, the impact of randomness where there's not a moral agent. For example, a spontaneous mutation that results in suffering and someone gets cancer and dies. If God creates randomness into his creation and the randomness results in that kind of suffering which does not result from moral conduct by us, what does that say about your God? Well, I'm saying that it's one of those situations that has two sides to it, that we do in fact suffer the consequences of that randomness and that that will have an effect upon us and um, may affect our relationship to God in one way or another. There was a a specific example, for example, in in the life of Christ when he was confronted with a, a man who'd been born blind 
And the prevailing philosophy was that there was some cause for this. It wasn't just a random event that either he had sinned or his parents, perhaps he'd even sinned in the womb, strangely enough, they had that idea. Uh, And that kind of idea exists in some Eastern uh, philosophies, uh, the idea of karma, that things happen because of what we have done. And Jesus says, not so. He said that it didn't happen because somebody did something wrong and deserved this blindness, for example. But whatever happened, he said, here's an opportunity for you to experience the grace of God in a way that you might not had this not happened. Now, I know that's very easy for me to say, but that's the only sense I can make out of this, that God doesn't pick out people for deliberate suffering. I think David Bartholomew spoke here a year or two ago, and one of his ideas is that the idea of things being random makes them, in a sense, fair. You know, we use a toss of a coin to determine the start of a game because it's fair, it's not biased in any sense. And so when these things happen, it's not because we deserved it and so on. It's just the way the world works. And what I'm suggesting tonight is that because um, the world does work that way, God can work with whatever happens with us in that situation. Um, and, And people do suffer terrible things. And we can only um, ask God for the grace to cope with it. And that's all I could do personally. I'm not sure how I would cope um, in terrible situations that have afflicted some people. Um, And and as I say, I don't have all the answers here. But I, I think that's... I'm suggesting that even when these terrible things happen, there's still an opportunity for us to experience God as a person in our relationship. And I think that's the message of the book of Job. Job suffered terribly, unjustly. And he argued with God and asked him for a reason why this was happening. And God didn't give him a reason. What God gave him was a relationship um, and asked him to trust him. And I think in these situations, we, we can't explain the details of what happens. We're simply asked to trust in God's goodness because there are, There's other evidence elsewhere of God's love and care for us, and we can hold on to that. That's not a complete answer, and it's not a proof, but then um, there are things in all relationships that we can't prove in that sense, but we can experience and have confidence in them. I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's the best I can do. (laughs) Okay. Um, all right, so if I can summarize your um, your position here, you say you, you caricature, well, at least with regards to how good things can happen to bad people, or bad things can happen to good people, sorry. Um, you characterize God as a kind of a chess master um, who can win no matter what we do without restricting our freedom or his sovereignty. And um, bad things have thus worked for the good um, by your analogy of uh, God being a father teaching his children how to ride a bicycle. Um, But um, I'd like to know what the the upshots are that for evil. I mean, is evil now no longer evil, or um, is it still evil but used for good? Um, So, I mean, as far as I can see it, uh, if you take the latter option, then um, God still allows evil, and that would make him not perfectly good, and that's a problem. But um, if you take the former option, then you're saying something very counterintuitive. I mean, to, to, to try to argue that murder is somehow good is pretty tricky. And I think you're going to need to commit to that. You're going to have to bite the bullet in that regard um, if you're going to hold to your account. So um, I'd like to know if you've got any way of trying getting around that, if, if, I've, um, if I've seen this correctly or, or not. Well, I, <clears throat> I think... Um I would like to think you haven't seen it quite correctly, and it's a bit like the previous question from the lady over here, um, that I'm not ever suggesting that that evil becomes good because God can take whatever happens and turn it to good. Um, It doesn't absolve us of our moral responsibility at all, that evil is still evil, but what I'm suggesting is that evil will not win in the end. And that's the message of the Bible, that in the end of things, God will ensure that evil will not come out on top. 
that for the time it has to be this way in order for us to have the freedom uh, to develop and to grow and to have this personal relationship with God because perhaps it just can't be done any other way. Perhaps we just can't give someone free will and at the same time not give them free will. It's a logical contradiction. And and just of the very nature of things, um, there are limits to what even God can do in this kind of world. Um, And I'm not in the position to say, well, that's not good enough, God. You shouldn't have done it then. Um, I think God knows more than I do about the ultimate good and purpose of things. Maybe any universe you wanted to make this one, and you Mm -hmm. would go to hold to the the claims of what God God nature is. Um, It's going to involve me being perfectly good and um, knowing absolutely everything. So we've got to try to balance those to make our Well, it, do, it does, but it assumes that we know what is perfectly good. And, and that's where I'd have to challenge you. I'm not sure that we do know what is perfectly good. And that sometimes we have to do things that cause pain in order to bring a greater good. Um, and sometimes we can put up with pain when we've come through it and out the other side and, and the experience of women in this room who have given birth will testify to that, that they go through the pain of childbirth and yet when the child is there for the joy they have, they forget about the pain. Um, that's not to justify the pain, but it's saying it's putting it in a different context. I think when you have an operation in hospital, you sign a consent form for a, a man to, or a woman to commit a violent act upon you you know, to cut you open and cause you wounding because ultimately that will be uh, for your healing. And so knowing what is good needs knowledge of the bigger picture, as it were. And I don't think that we are in a position to know the bigger picture. And that's the message of Job. Job, God says to Job, look, where were you when I created the world? Your brain just isn't big enough to take all this in. You say you want the truth, but to quote a phrase, you couldn't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so there are limits to what we can know. Okay? And uh, I think we get to a point where we, we do have to say, well, I've gone as far as I can with this, and now I've just got to commit one way or the other. I'm going to trust God or I'm not. I'll never know. And I said this right at the beginning, remember? I don't know all the answers. Okay? Um, but I think we've got to push and try to find out as much as we can so that we have a coherent Um, consistent understanding of God and our experience of the world. Thank you very much for some of the answers that you've already given to the people who asked questions and also some of your uh, talk uh, generally. There was one thing I found uh, maybe I misunderstood or I don't quite understood about the fact that you make God sovereign because that he is in control of chaos or chances. Because for me, I see God before the chaos. I see the chaos within the character of God and the chances within the character of God, but not outside the character of God. And I believe that God will be anyway sovereign, whether or not there will be chances um, and chaos. Whether there was chaos or chances, God will be always sovereign. God's sovereignty is not defined by chaos and chances. I find it difficult to define God's sovereignty in line with that because who is in the mind of God? We cannot understand God himself. And also this notion of freedom that when Adam and Eve have been given freedom, this freedom have actually um, have influence on the whole universe. This is why St. Paul speaks about this kind of groaning. The whole universe is waiting to be free. And there is a, question, a notion of freedom. For human beings, we are created with our free will and freedom. And also the universe is waiting to be free. Therefore, all the chaos, all the problems, which are suffering, if you want, which happen in the universe, there is, there is this kind of mystery that we cannot always comprehend. And if we understand anyway what we can understand about suffering, if, especially if you are a Christian, we can understand it out of, we can offer it up like you said, we can trust God and good can go out of it. But for someone who is an atheist, for someone who is scientific, who don't understand about the suffering, they might think that um, there is no God, a God like many, of, uh, many people, but um, this implies also that the suffering wouldn't maybe work for another good for something else. But, but, but my, qu- my question is that why do you make God sovereign because of him controlling chaos and chances? Because I do, I do believe that God is, is beyond 
this kind of, you know, chaos and, and chances. So, so, Not character, anyway. So, is, is chaos is also more dependent upon chaos? Is that, that really Because you say that there was a line you were saying that um, you say that God, um, there, is, uh, there is chance and, and chaos existent, but for God is sovereign. Because he's controlling this. I agree that he's controlling the chaos. I agree with that. He's controlling the chances. I agree with that. But it's not what makes him sovereign. Okay. He's already sovereign before okay. that. Yeah, yes, I think, I think I agree with you that, that God is sovereign and that perhaps he could have made a different world, a different universe. He could have made things differently. Um, but I think we probably are coming to the view from the scientific perspective that... <clears throat> There are, if you have a certain set of, of, of rules, as it were, if, if the world is made of a certain kind of stuff, then it has to behave a certain way. If the constants of nature have these values, then you get life in the world. And if they're slightly different, then you don't. So there are constraints over what even God can do with stuff, as it were. I'm, I'm, I have a faith in a God who is rational, not a God who does magic, as it were, and makes rabbits appear out of nothing. Um, I think that God works in a coherent and rational way and, he, and therefore creates a, a, a prospect of relationship between us because we can understand one another. If everything was totally random and unpredictable, we wouldn't be able to know anything. So there has to be a certain amount of order for us to be able to operate. What I'm saying is that God includes a certain amount of randomness in different parts of creation but nonetheless, he doesn't give up total sovereignty. He does allow freedom to the world and to us. But no matter what happens or what we choose to do, God can still work with whatever happens. He's not defined by that because he could have made it differently. But this is the only universe we have. And, and so I'm trying to make sense out of this world. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for your comments tonight, which have been enormously enlightening in regard to where your own work in the sciences have come. I think the random fluctuations I found really exciting and would love to see what the future implications of that ongoing research will be. But at the moment, it seems we are wrestling with an issue about... Um, how science might dialogue with other disciplines and in particular with philosophy and theology. And I think one of the questions being raised here is whether, um, and which I think Bill, uh, Professor Bill Blundell raised last week when she prescriptively said what she couldn't allow uh, in the imagination or in inspiration as to how theology comes to its knowledge or explorations of reality. These are perhaps comparable to what you're doing in the sciences. That we do need to explore that reality in an academic setting with the same stringency that is demanded of the sciences. Now, that's not to preclude our trust and faith and our wrestling with that aspect but I still think that at the academic level, we have a very major concern that the dialogue between theology and the sciences needs to um, relate to serious theology, very serious, in which philosophy and theology is explored in the same way as is being undertaken in your work in physics. Would you like me to respond to that, Margaret? Okay. <laughs> um, I think that's a big challenge, and I think it's, it's one that we need to take seriously. I agree with you. I think we, we can be optimistic that we can make some progress, but we need to be realistic as well to realize that science and theology, although they come together in some areas are in one sense radically different disciplines and they use different methods and they deal with different aspects of reality. Um, so that science gives us part of the picture and theology gives us a different part of the picture. And of course they 
have an interface, and that's what this seminar series is about, to explore um, what the implications of science are for theology and vice versa. Um, and I think you're right that we do need to be rigorous in our thinking, and uh, I'm trying to do that. I may not always succeed, but it's important that when we bring the two things together, we try to keep them coherent and consistent, and that we don't simply shrug our shoulders and say, well, it works in theology, but it doesn't work in science, and I don't care. We should try to be intellectually honest in everything that we do, because we're both concerned with the truth, whether the truth about the physical world or the truth about the spiritual world. Um, and where they impinge upon one another, truth's even more important. Hi, this is a, a physics question, actually. Um, oh I was just wondering whether um, indeterminacy is a fashion in physics that could theoretically pass. Because physics went through a, a phase where it was deterministic and then indeterministic now. Could it be a phase that may pass, a fashion that may pass? Oh, good. That's a question I don't know the answer to. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's... <laughs> It's always risky when, when scientists say, well, we've, we've finished with this now, everything rest is just filling in the details. And classical physics made that mistake 100 years ago. And as you say, we now have to re re bring in quantum ideas with indeterminacy and so on. I think that the progress that science makes is rarely a total overthrow of what went before, but a, a subsuming of previous science into a, a bigger, more general picture where the older science is seen as a special case. For example, classical physics works provided the things aren't too small and they're not moving too fast. Um, if they get too fast, then we need relativity. If they get too small, we've got to use quantum theory. So if we get beyond those regimes you know, to even smaller things, perhaps we need a new kind of quantum theory. But we'll still find, I think, that in the ranges that we're dealing with now, that quantum theory will still work. But maybe a special case of something bigger or deeper, um, and that's what many people are struggling with at the moment, to find a theory of everything that will say that quantum theory is just a little bit of the big picture. Um, so you may well be right, but um, I wouldn't hold your breath. So my, my follow-up question would be, are we then putting all our eggs in a basket, saying that if the world is indeterminate, only then can God... Only then free will and DODC be explained. I think it's a, a bit dangerous in that case. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. No, well, I'm not saying that, um, that I've explained free will. Okay. I'm, I'm just taking free will as a given here. Um, if you want me to justify my belief in free will, then I'll give you another seminar. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is a scientific consensus at the moment that free will is also an illusion um, and that our brain just does stuff and we only think we're thinking it. But we're not really thinking we're thinking it because something else is doing it all the time and giving us the illusion that we're thinking of it. And actually, I think that's nonsense. Okay. Um, philosophically nonsense and actually scientifically doubtful as well. Um, there are experiments done by a man called Heisenberg, not the one you're thinking of, but a biologist, I think a descendant of Werner Heisenberg, who studied... Um, the uh, response of uh, insects and, and small animals to stimuli. And, of course, the prevailing notion is that an animal, uh, an unconscious creature, simply responds to a stimulus, and it's totally determined. And what he found was that's not the case, that actually there's randomness there, and that even something as humble as a fruit fly can actually make a choice about which way to jump. Um, and there are infinite, large number of possibilities that um, organisms can take, and it's not all determined. And if that's the case at that level, then our thinking is not determined either. So we do have free will, and we are able to make free choices. And so it's a, a mistake to say that our free will is an illusion. But you're right that we shouldn't put all our eggs in one particular scientific basket, because that basket might be spilled down the road. Um, but I think we'd have to do our best to make sure that our faith is as consistent with the best understanding we have. And we use 
our science to so that our faith will seek understanding. I just want to ask a quick question on myself because um, it's interesting you mentioned the free will debate because that's, that's an, that, that may be interpreted as an example of people doing scientific experiments but not looking at the philosophical setups of the experiments. And uh, Professor Hacker from this university has criticised those experiments in a very interesting book, Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience. So um, that may be an example of, of science being done without philosophical care. But do you think it also works the other way around? Because having been a scientist and then having trained in philosophy, what, what, what I find curious is a lot of philosophers work with a model of science that stops in about 1850. And, um, and actually, they're very comfortable with that. Uh, they, they're used to working that way. And then, and then theology borrows some of those models, yeah. because, uh, you know, particularly um, through Kant and so on. Yeah. So um, do you think it's, it's incumbent, do you get frustrated with this um, when you hear philosophers of science speak? Um, and how do you think the situation might be remedied that philosophers get um, insights into some of the developments of modern science, particularly some of this extraordinary work with quantum jumps and the uh, creative power, if you like, of, of chaos? Well, I would, I would like to see philosophers um, stay up to date, and, and theologians as well, of course, but to, it is, it's not easy for someone to stay abreast of, of developments in, in science. It's difficult for scientists to keep abreast of, of what's going on in another subdiscipline. Um, so one has to have some sympathy uh, with, with the theologians and philosophers. Um, but I, I think it would be good if we talked to each other more and, and we developed a language that we could share and, and talk about things that we could mutually understand. Um, and form a basis for pushing the barriers, as it were. Um, I, I think there are philosophers today who are grappling with uh, the implications of, of quantum theory. Uh, there are even philosophers of science who now question the whole idea of law and, and the existence of, of law. Um, and that has theological implications, because if there's no laws, there's no need for a lawgiver. Um, and so one can eliminate God if we can eliminate the laws of nature. Um, I think that's flawed as well, um, exactly because of chance in the world. Chance explains the fact that the laws don't always work. Um, but one mustn't conclude that because the laws don't always work that there are no laws. Um, and I think that's a philosophical mistake that, that, that those particular philosophers are making. But we do need to have that dialogue, and, and philosophers do need to understand what real science does and what its limitations are. And actually, scientists need to remember what the limitations of science are as well, and not to extrapolate uh, uh, beyond their competence. Thank you. I think we'll probably, oh, we'll probably have one more quick question, then we'll have to call it a day. If anyone's got any other questions. One more, one more, gentlemen. Yes. I mean, I, just that uh, I've been, maybe as some other people, I've been listening to a, a series on, on, um, uh, on, on the brain on, on Radio 4, and I wondered if you had, uh, you know, thought about, uh, I, I know very little about whether there's a, a relationship between, between the, the neuroscience and perhaps what's going on in the brain, and uh, again, if essentially randomness that's taking place there, which, which again maybe links into some of the discussions we've had tonight. So the question is, um, is there... Is our brain chaotic? Is, is our brain chaotic? Is our brain chaotic? Um, well, I think there's a lot of speculation at, at the moment um, and a lot of actually rather fuzzy thinking about uh, the brain. And, and, and neuroscientists are all tickled with this new idea of functional imaging where you can discover which part of the brain is doing what. And I... I'm delighted for them that they're having so much fun, but <laughs> actually I always knew my thinking went on somewhere in there, um, and so the fact that they can now pinpoint that to an extra few centimetres doesn't excite me that much. Okay? I know that my brain is doing my thinking, um, and it will be helpful, no doubt, to un uncover more about how it actually works, so I'm not being too dismissive. Um, if I'm allowed to speculate, I want to bring in something that we didn't touch on tonight, and that is 
uh, the growing sense in science of emergence of the idea that there are laws, organizational laws that govern the behavior of things that only exist when you get to a certain level of complexity and that they can then determine downwards what happens at lower levels so that reductionism doesn't explain everything and indeed can't philosophically explain everything, especially things like thinking and brain function. So that one, if I was allowed to speculate, I might say that our neurons in our brain are constantly exchanging chemicals and electrical signals, and there's a kind of random buzz going on there, um, and that at a higher level, our thinking can select from those signals ones that will build into a coherent thought, as it were. So perhaps there is randomness going on in our brain. Sometimes my brain gets more random at times than others. Um, and so my thoughts go off in different directions. And I can choose which one to focus on. So there's some interaction between higher level functions and emergent property of the brain that can act downwardly on the cellular levels of neuron interactions. So I think you may well be right that there is... Um, randomness there There's, uh, it's offering to us if you like lots of choices of what to do and what to think and our higher level functions then select from those interactions which thought to form and to develop if that's, that's only a speculation by someone who knows nothing about neuroscience yeah, thank you, I mean, that, that, that kind of point towards emergent, yes. emergent behaviour yeah. yeah. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoy, I've learned a lot from your discussion. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much. I think it's one thing to know a lot about one's own field, but to be able to communicate it so clearly and to draw out some of the, the philosophical implications. So that's, that's really wonderful. So we're very, very grateful to you, Professor Ewart, for, for your uh, talk this evening. Um, just a, a final news flash about the last and uh, final seminar of the Ian Ramsey Centre series this term. Uh, it, won't be, it, won't be, uh, it won't be two weeks' time on Thursday. It's going to be on the Tuesday, on the Tuesday the 29th of November. And then we'll have Dr. Connor Cunningham. And if some of you remember the Darwin year we had in 2009, uh, he, he actually appeared on a, a BBC programme talking about uh, the philosophical and theological implications of Darwinism. And he's going to be talking on the subject of Darwin's pious idea. That's Tuesday, 29th of November. Thank you very much. <laughs>